pressing record. So good morning to all those who are listening and thank you for participating for all those who are live. Today's uh, Shira Parashat Nassau is sponsored by uh, two parties here. First of all, we thank Zev and Susan Shainhouse for sponsoring to commemorate the yard site of Zev's mother, the Shane House, Bracha Devora Bat Eliel Veriva, as a Fernali Bracha. So we do thank the Shane Houses. The Nisham Shalav and Aliyah from the Divrei Torah will be studying here today. I would like to also thank George and Florence <coughs> Weinberger, who are sponsoring in memory of George's grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins who were transported to Auschwitz and Shavuot. 1944 and perished in the Shoah. So we thank you. The Neshamas of those Kedoshim uh, should benefit from our words of Torah that we study here today from the parasha that is the longest in the Torah, Parashat Nasa. Perhaps not a coincidence that right after Shavuot, a time of commitment to Torah, we go ahead and go ahead and have a very long uh, parasha. Now, I sent you uh, what we call Mare Mekomot, some sources to go through. And as we get to them, we're going to open them up on the computer. You could go ahead and review them with us. But we have to remind ourselves again, what is Parashat Nasa about? So it is in the book of Bamidbar, our ancestors are in the wilderness. Many things occurred in the wilderness, some good, some problematic. It is a book that describes us what the Jewish journey is about. And Jews, I don't know if you're aware of it, are complicated people. Jews are quite talented, and nothing against Jews. They're some of my best friends are Jews, but they are complicated beings. But the Almighty, recognizing that, gave us this book that if we tune in to the messages of the, of the book, we could actually work with our personalities and not just remove the flaw, but somehow create a, a, some magnificence that has a very positive impact on the world. And the good news is we've been doing it for many, many, many years. Jews have done a lot of good. So what Parashat Naso. Parashat Naso is one where there's a focus on the formation of the camp. In other words, they traveled throughout the years in the wilderness. As we learned in Parashat Bamidbar, every tribe settled in a specific area, but the camp had to retain some kind of spiritual structure. And as we'll see soon, there was a need to remove specific individuals from the camp. Some had to be removed completely from the camp. Some of them could not be in areas that are sanctified. And some of them could not be in areas that were extremely sanctified. So that's what we're going to learn. And obviously, when we read about formations that relate to the camp of our ancestors, it's not just something that was relevant 3,400 years ago, but rather it is to teach us something about humanity and about areas that we have to work on and that's what we're going to focus on so it's not just a study of parashat naso it's a study of how we can learn from parashat naso so with that we're going to go ahead and turn to our sources here and source number one source number one is going to be a pasuk that appears in the fifth chapter, in the fifth chapter of Par Chumash Bamidvar, verse 2, where the Almighty is going to tell the people of Israel, listen, Tzav, right? Tzav et b'nei Israel, Tell the people of Israel. And what should they do? The shalechu minamachane. You know who you got to ship out? Three types of individuals. Now, they're not going to all be shipped out completely but rather some of them are going to be shipped out indeed completely, but others not. And who are the three? So here we go. You have to ship out Kol Sarua, 
anyone that has sara'at, sara'at, which is an ailment we've discussed and studied in the past that was some kind of leprosy that was spiritual, a clear indication of a social flaw. Because when someone has a skin ailment, he has to be quarantined from others, and therefore he has to be detached from the community. And it is viewed as a punishment for one who does not have an appreciation for the need of community. And one who appreciates community understands that you have to be decent and sensitive to others. You have to be careful what you say. You have to be careful what you share. That is what is expected for us to create a healthy community. So that sarua, the person who develops saraat, and according to the rabbis, the word mitzora relates to motzi shemra, that finds the negative in everyone. Every interaction and any time he spots someone else, he's only going to focus on the negative. And he focuses on the negative, you only think about the negative. And people that only think about the negative of others are going to eventually only share that negative with others. And that is how you destroy a society. Societies are destroyed when you have people looting stores and destroying windows because they're very upset uh, that a person in their community was killed by a policeman. Now, I have a feeling that they're not so upset about that. They're just people that are closer to animals in some ways due to the fact that they are lacking teachings that Torah could provide. And to prove to you that idea that it's not so much the concern for a loss of a human life, because when there's crime within their own communities, you don't see them going bishuga. That's a feeling I have, perhaps I'm wrong. But reality is that just as we cannot have a society where people destroy businesses because they are angry, even if they have a, re a good reason to be angry, you don't go ahead and destroy another person's property. You don't go ahead and just feel that it is a time to take revenge on more powerful people. So too in Judaism, Lashon Hara has the same level of damage. Because when you start sharing negative about others, and that person simply you know, has nowhere to hide, right? And you destroy an, a, a reputation of another person because you thought that you saw him doing something wrong, that is just as much as, of a destruction as looting, okay? So therefore, the tsarua has no place in the community at all. The next individual who is not going to have the right to be everywhere is the zav, the zav. The Zav was a person that has something that's emitted from the body that relates to, according to tradition, to desire, someone that is driven completely by his sexual desire. And it symbolizes all people that are driven by ta'ava, desire. All they want to do is satisfy the animal from within. Such a person has to be removed from some portion of the camp. We'll see soon which one. And the third one is a person who is tame lenefesh, someone that came in contact with the corpse. He is welcome in most of the camp. However, there is one section of the camp that such an individual is not going to be welcome. And to study this verse and appreciate it as the rabbis spell it out, we're going to have to go through a Rashi. And Rashi tells us that you should know, shalosh machanot hayusham, when, that, when it comes to the settlement of our ancestors. And remember, this is not just relevant for them. This is not just a map for our ancestors 3,400 years ago, but it's a map for us today to understand how to behave as humans. That you should know the format of the camp was that there was an area that was called Toch HaKlaim, within the curtains, the curtains of the tabernacle. And this was an area that was known as Machanesh Shechina. That was the area that was designated for the divine presence, where the Kohanim would perform their service, but we would be inspired there because it is the dwelling place of the Shechina of the Almighty. But that was section number one, and that's in a red box, if you see on the bottom of your page. Number two was the area where the Leviim were placed, Chaniyat Leviim, the, the, the settlement of the Levites, which was Saviv Machane, which was Saviv, which was Machane Leviya. That was the area designated for the Leviim. 
And the third area between, it was the area here between the green line and the blue line was Machane Yisrael, the camp of the Israelites. This is what we are told, the camp of the Israelites. So now, what we're going to see is the following that you should know. Hatsarua, the Tsarua, Nishlach Chutz Lekulan. So, what we're going to be told is that if you are at Tsarua, if you do not have the sensitivity to what the format of a community is about, you do not belong in a community. So, you're going to be placed outside of all three camps. So, someone with Tsarat is going to be right here, right? Not within the camps, period. No room for you if you do not have sensitivity to the fact that you have to be careful with what you utter about others. The Zav, on the other hand, yes, there's impurity that relates to a overwhelming or a very strong sexual drive, but nevertheless, he's welcome. We welcome people that are flawed. No problem with flawed people. We welcome them. We welcome them. And he could be in Machane Israel. The person that, has, that is the Zav is welcome to be in the Machane Israel. However, he is Mishulach. He had to be, got to be sent away from the Machane Shechina. You got to send him out. You got to send him out from the Machane Leviya. Okay? Why is it that a person that has extreme uh, desire needs to be shipped out of the Machane Leviya, okay? So, you know, imagine a person has a big ego. I don't know if you've ever interacted with anyone with a real, like, big ego. So such a person, is part of the community. Uh, you know, we can interact with him as long as he's careful not to speak Lashon Har about others and be sensitive to others. He could be part of the community. But if he has a very big ego, right, which is something that is a, a desire for, uh, for, for self, there's going to be a problem if he's going to be a teacher, if he's going to be, if he's going to be our educator. Or someone, for example, that has weaknesses in the area of uh, sweat, sexual desires. He has no control. I don't want him to be a teacher. He can't be a teacher. He's going to corrupt the teachings, and he cannot be that Levi. A Levi who is there to teach us Torah, to give us the wrong from the right, to clarify what tradition is about. He cannot be the person that is controlled by his Yetzer Hara, by his evil inclination. He could be part of the community, but he can't be the teacher. And then we are told, then we are told that there, if there's a person that is tameh lenefesh, if he is impure, he is 100% welcome in the Machane Israel. If a person came in contact with a corpse, he is 100% welcome in the Machane Levia, but you have to keep him out of the Machane Shechina. You have, you have to keep him out of the camp where the Shechina is. Why? All this needs clarification. So to really appreciate all we are discussing, we're going to have to go ahead and study a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot in reference number three. And this Mishnah really will give us a complete picture. What you need to remember up until this point is the format of the camp and who is sent out from what area. Comes this very well-known Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, where were we told by Rabbi Lazar Akipar, Hakina ta'ava en kavod, motzi'in et ha'adam mina olam. Kina, jealousy, ta'ava, desire, kavod, honor, remove a person from the world. Motzi'in et ha'adam mina olam. Now what does that mean exactly, to remove someone from the person? We live in this world with an understanding that it is having an impact not just on the physical but spiritual world as well. 
when a person is completely controlled by one of these three vices, life is not life. Life is not life. You are not achieving things. In other words, if jealousy controls me completely, if the fact that my neighbor has a much nicer home and much nicer car, and it is something that I'm simply unsettled with, I live with that jealousy day in, day out. And as we all know, sometimes strong natural tendencies just grow with age. And if I don't address the issue, does his nishken leben, as they would say in Yiddish, it's not a life because I am completely controlled by jealousy. You're not, you're removed from the world. How can you achieve anything if the only thing occupying your mind is jealousy? So too, when it comes to desire, there are desires, physical desires, right? We know very well, I'm sure there's not one person here that doesn't know a story of someone that failed because of desire, right? They perhaps were extremely successful in many areas. It could be financial, right? It could be in politics, at least in the olden days, you know, people would uh, uh, fall politically uh, because of desire. Unfortunately, even in the rabbinic world, there are such stories, right? Of people, you know, people that had great potential, but reality is that desire took over their life and they were destroyed. And the third one, where we are being warned here, because it's within us and therefore we have to address it, the third one is kavod. What exactly is this kavod issue? What is kavod? So some would say, well, the desire for honor. Well, kavod is not such a bad word, by the way. Right? Mi hu ze melech ha kavod. Lechabed, to honor people is, not, is usually something that's quite positive. So we're going to have to go ahead and focus a little bit on what is this kavod that brings about destruction. It removes the person from the world. So therefore, we're going to have to turn to the next Mishnah, uh, another Mishnah Pirkei Avot, where we are asked the question, Ezu Mechubad, who is an honorable person? Who is an honorable person? So we are told, HaMechabed et HaPriyot, if you honor creation and those who were created by God, you are honorable. And they quote a pasuk. Now we've heard this Mishnah Navot, but what is not focused on is the pasuk that it's quoted from. So we're going to focus soon on the pasu, but let's talk a little bit about kavod. Imagine I am extremely talented. Let's say I'm a singer, right? And, and we're talking about up there. I'm a Pavarotti, all of a shalom. Or I'm a Andrea Bocelli. That's the problem with, with Zoom. No one could assist me now with throwing out good names. But let's go Andrea Bocelli, someone with complete great talent. Pavarotti perhaps is a better example. So I'm Pavarotti, I, I, I think, I hope people do know who Luciano Pavarotti was. A nod, please, anyone? Okay, I see some people smiling, good enough. So Pavarotti, I'm Pavarotti, and I do a performance. And it's incredible. And uh, the crowd's on its feet, and I, I leave, I leave uh, uh, the performing hall, uh, Carnegie Hall, and I go into a restaurant, and they make me wait in line. And I say to myself, the chutzpah, that these nothings, can make me wait. Do you know who? I'm Pavarotti, right? And I have an appetite, obviously, and I need to eat. And they're making me wait. Do they not know who I am? He expects, expects kavod, right? And it could relate to many industries, a very talented professor, a very wealthy person. Have you ever interacted with someone that is extremely wealthy? And has this expectation that due to the fact that I am, you know, so successful, shouldn't people be honoring me? Who are you? You're a nobody. You're a bunch of nobodies compared to me. Unfortunately, it could be a rabbi, right? In most cases, not because rabbis in general, the ones I have interacted throughout my life, Torah has had a very positive impact on them and they overcome this tendency. But unfortunately, there are those that have failed. That say, you know, Ich bin a Talmid Chacham, and you're Dubis that Garnish, you're a nobody. How do you not honor me? That's bad kavod. Okay? That is very bad kavod. Now, what's proper kavod? 
proper kavod is to realize that everything created is to honor Hashem. In other words, when I go outside and I see a bird, right? It could be the uh, it could be a sparrow or robin, or if I'm in South Florida, I could see uh, you know a, a spoonbill or, or a pelican, and I see its magnificence and beauty and the wisdom Hakadosh Baruch Hu placed in this creature and its ability to adapt. And I say, there's a creator. So that bird has just given kavod Hashem has honored Hakadosh Baruch Hu. And I see in the briot, I see in creation, the honor of God. And so too, when I see another person, every person has their unique toolbox. Every person that uses their toolbox to do good in the world is marbek vot shamayim, increases the honor of Hashem. So when I look at other creatures, right, and I look, or not just creatures, but I look at the world and humanity, and I see in them, I see in every person the spirit of God. And if they're doing good, I say they're doing something that's incredible for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, right? Some of you have the privilege of walking the streets of Yerushalayim. And you see someone that's cleaning the streets, right? Think about the fact what, what honor they are doing. True, they're getting paid, but it doesn't make a difference. They're doing something that's honorable. For 2,000 years, you couldn't do it. And today, you could clean the streets of Yerushalayim. That is a kavod, and they deserve the same amount of kavod than anyone else, than the greatest scholar. Why? They are created by God, and they're doing something for the honor of God. If I walk around with the attitude that everyone deserves honor, then I am mechubad, then I deserve honor, right? Because we're all, we're all the same. It's not that everyone else is garnished and I'm significant. We're all significant. The world is significant. That's good kavod. Bad kavod is if I look at everything else and everyone else as not me. Right? They're not me and therefore they're garnished. I'm significant. You people are in my way in the restaurant. I want to get to my meal. You are a bunch of ins insignificant beings because I deserve the kavod. That's bad kavod, and that is motzi et adam mina olam. There's a word in Hebrew called booz or boz. In other words, I think if, if at, at a performance someone doesn't do a good job and they give him a booz, it's a boo. For them, it's booz from the word levazot. A flawed kavod is when you look at others as. Entities that need to be booz, levazot acherim, you shame others. That's a situation of problematic kavod. And that is motzi in et adam in olam. The good kavod is hamechabed et abriot. Now, let's look back at this Mishnah on page, on Ezeu uh, mechubad, right? Who is the one that is honorable? Hamechabed et abriot, one who honors creatures, or I should say, all that which was created by the, by the Almighty. And we're going to go ahead and quote a pasuk in Shmuel. Now, here we go. Please tune into this verse. Ki mechabdai achabed. God says, those who honor me, I shall honor. Ubozai, but people who are mevazeh, who shame, who disrespect, who consider me insignificant, yikalu, they will be considered kalite, insignificant. What's the context of that verse? So the context is in the beginning of the book of Shmuel, it starts off with a, a Kohen by the name of Eli, who is righteous. And he is the head of the temple in Shiloh. We visited Shiloh right, nine and a half years ago. And Eli was a righteous leader and a righteous Kohen, but the problem is sometimes in royal families that even if the head of the family is righteous, the children think that they deserve the honor, the covet, and it's theirs. And they start honoring themselves and consider everyone else insignificant. So while the righteous Kohen, when he sees another person that has a need, 
is happy to go ahead and assist because he knows he is doing his part in boosting the welfare of another person, the Kohen who is treating himself like a member of the royal family looks at others as a major pain. And the children of Eli were such individuals that when people would knock on their door for service, they would have no interest. Why are you disturbing me? I'm a Kohen, right? I deserve honor. Your only job is to treat me with dignity and honor and cover. I expect the red carpet, not that I have to go ahead and take care of your needs now by offering a korban. Don't bother me. And the Almighty communicates to Eli and he says, you know what? I wanted originally to let your family be the ones to continue with the traditions of the Kohen. In other words, within the descendants of Aaron, there are different branches. God said, originally, I wanted your branch, right, from the family of Itamar to continue the tradition. But the problem is, you guys are not doing what you should be doing. So in verse 5, Amor Amarti, God said, originally, I thought, Beit Chada, your household, meaning your branch within the Kohanim's family. But the problem is, since you're not doing your job, I can't do it. Because mechabdai, those who honor me, right? Those who understand that you honor everything, and by honor everything, by honoring every person, you are honoring God because you see them as a piece in this magnificent puzzle called creation and God Almighty. On the other hand, people who look at others as boz, as, as just not me, and therefore you're not me, the other person is Gehenim, is, is not something I want to interact with, with. Yikalu, they are ones going to be light and insignificant. So here we have it. Now we have an understanding what kavod is about. Kavod, good kavod is, I honor everything. Because there's significance in everyone. There's significance in life. There's significance in the world. And there's a way to look at the world where we are inspired by nature. We are inspired by the animal kingdom. We study it and we see HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And obviously, it has to relate to other people as well, that we see in them, we see the good in them, and we see how they are adding to kavod shamayim. That is what kavod is about, and that is obviously the role of a kohen. That is what we expect from the kohen. The kohen is a person, right? When he is doing what he should be doing, he loves people, and he increases the honor of the Almighty. And therefore, as we all have taught many, many times, what does Hillel say? Hillel Omer, Hevei Meh, Talmidav Shel Aharon. Be from the disciples of Aharon. What was the, what was the way of life of Aharon? Ohev Shalom, love peace, Rodev Shalom. And then Ohev et a lover of all creatures, of all creation. Because I look at the other person, not as the person that is taking away from my honor, but we're all in it together because there is significance to life, significance to existence. And that's how you bring them close to Torah. So now when you look at the camp of the Israelites, you can understand very, very well, you cannot, you cannot have a tameh lenefesh, a person who came in contact with the corpse, in the area of Machanesh China. In other words, while a person that does not respect society at all is not welcome in Machane Israel, you cannot have them in the camp of the Israelites. There's no way to have someone here that is causing Machloikis and is talking Lashon Hara. So he belongs here. The person that has desire very strong, unfortunately, desire controls him. He could be here, but don't allow him to be among the Leviim. Don't allow him to teach Torah if, unfortunately, he has no self-control. The person, on the other hand, that came in contact with the corpse is welcome 100%. He could be a teacher of Torah. But the core of Judaism, the Machanesh Shechina of Judaism, which is the core, is the value of life. Life is valuable. We talk about this often. 
that in Judaism, it's not all about just getting to Olam Abba. It's about realizing that there's value in the world. You love creation. You see the honor of God in all of creation. And you are ohevet abriot. And that's how you bring them close to Torah. And you have to value life, right? You have to be full of life. We've interacted with people. They just love life and love people. That is the Aaron HaKohen way of living. And when a person came in contact with death, right? And sometimes it, it, it minimizes that spirit of life. He's a welcome person. He could be our teacher. He could be our guide. And we treat him with respect and dignity. But he is not, the core of Judaism is a little bit rubbed off. Obviously, he could purify himself and return to the Machane Shechina, but the Machane Shechina is designated for the Kohen. The Machane Shechina, the inner camp, which is the core of Judaism, is the value of life, which belongs to the Kohen that sees value in everyone and sees value in life. That is what we have up until this point. Now, if you see here, I wrote something called the, the problem I faced in life of hashkafic sholent. And this is something that I've felt for many, many years. And let me tell you what I call the problem of the hashkafic sholent. You know, when it comes to halachic practices, we all uh, know that there are disagreements. And due to the fact that we know that there are disagreements, we're not extremely surprised that if we call one rabbi and he says that you could put via Starbucks via coffee in a klish lishi on Shabbos, and you call another rabbi and he says you can't do it, you're not shocked. You're not shocked. You understand that there are different ways to look at halacha. And we call them both Torah Jews, because they're both trying to figure out how to practice their Judaism. Now, when it comes to what we call hashkafa, hashkafa is outlook of life, how to look at life. Sometimes there is a disagreement, but the problem is that people don't even notice that it's two different schools. And the schools become blended together, and therefore the result is what we are going to call the hashkafic cholent. And I'll give you a little bit of an example, an example to share this idea from two statements from earlier authorities, great authorities. But obviously, you're going to see here that they come from different schools. And you can choose your school, by the way. So here we go. In reference number seven, I'm going to share with you uh, an Italian authority, Rabbi Azad de Terani, a great Italian authority. And then I'm going to share with you an authority that originated in Germany and then lived in Spain, okay? Both of them are addressing the same question, hashkafic question, meaning not halachic, in Jewish thought. The question is, we all know that on Erev Yom Kippur, there is a mitzvah to eat. Big mitzvah to eat. The question is, why is there a mitzvah to eat, okay? So approach number one was Rabbi Isaiah, as Rabbi Yishayahu de Terani, known as Rab, the Rid. And he tells us, do you want to know why the Almighty wants us to eat on Erev Yom Kippur? So he tells us that Mipnei she'ochel yafe be'erev Yom HaKippurim. If you have a big meal Erev Yom Kippur, so you know what happens on Yom Kippur? There's a great contrast. The day before, you ate a lot. Yom Kippur, you eat a little. So the result is, you are suffering more on Yom Kippur. Kashelo inuyo yoter. You see that? Kashelo. It becomes more difficult to fast. God Almighty wants to increase your reward on Yom Kippur. And how does he increase your reward on Yom Kippur? By increasing your intake on Erev Yom Kippur, you're going to suffer more. You get more reward on Yom Kippur by suffering. That's school number one. School number two. School number two comes from Rabbi Yaakov Balaturim, and he is quoting, uh, he lives early 14th century. And he says, you want to know why you eat on Erev Yom Kippur? Me'ahavat hakadosh baruchu et Yisrael. 
God loves us. God doesn't want us suffering. God Almighty did not command us to fast. Once a year we need to, according to Torah law. And it's not as a punishment. Don't think God wants you to suffer. But rather you need an atonement. And therefore the fasting on Yom Kippur is, is tovatam. It's for their good. For atonement of sin. But since the Almighty knows that we're going to be uncomfortable on Yom Kippur, therefore he commands us, Sivam, Sheyochnu v'yishtut chila, the Almighty wants us to eat first. Kedei, Sheyochnu litanot v'shelo lahazik lehem ha'inui. In other words, God is trying to minimize our suffering and our affliction on Yom Kippur, therefore he tells us to eat on Erev Yom Kippurim. Two explanations that are coming from completely different schools. Very, very, very different schools. School number one is, you know what? Suffering is good. He wants you to suffer more in this world. And school number two is, no, absolutely not. God doesn't want you to suffer. So here we are, have hashkafic teachings that are extremely different. The problem is that people don't realize sometimes they come from different schools and you have to choose your school, right? When you interview a teacher, right? You got to know where he's coming from. You have to have a school, for example, needs to have a philosophy. And if he has the philosophy of, Tosf of Rabbi Isaiah of Trani, that's great, but he can't be teaching in my school. I don't want my students being taught this school. I'm not disrespecting it, but it has no place in my view of Judaism. And the problem is that in Ashkafa, people do not really, just there's no smicha in Ashkafa. When rabbis get smicha, they get smicha from knowledge in the halachic practices. And as a result of that, we don't really recognize there are different schools here. You know. One of the great uh, rabbinic figures in the past uh, century was a rabbi by the name of Rabbi Chatzko Levinstein. Rabbi Cheska Levinstein. He was known as the Mashgiach, first in the Mir, Yeshiva, and uh, Abe Kaplan and uh, Josh Gordon could probably tell you stories because both of their fathers uh, learned under him or probably... Uh, had some kind of uh, relationship in Shanghai under Rabbi Levinstein. And eventually he lands up in the Panivish Yeshiva. Now, Rabbi Chatzka Levinstein was a legend for self-control, complete self-control. And throughout his life, throughout his life, he would never, would never eat more than what he needs would never eat something to fulfill a desire, never eat something sweet that was enjoyable. He was all about self-control. There's a story about him that when he was 10 years, uh, right at when he was 10 or 13, at a, very, as a, at a very young age, unfortunately, he had to go out to work to support his family. I think his mother passed away and he worked the whole week to save up some money to feed his family members as a child, as a 13-year-old. And Erev Shabbos, he went to the bathhouse, and when he came out of the bathhouse, the money he had in his pocket was gone. And he was disappointed, and he said to himself as a 13-year-old, if that which I worked so hard for could just vanish suddenly, I want to work in my life on something that remains with me. And therefore, I'm going to focus on self-improvement. And from age 13 on, he was a very spiritual being because his focus was self-improvement. Now. Rabbi Chesko Levinstein is someone that obviously we could be inspired by, but that's not the, that is not the same school of other rabbis. And what do I mean by that? We had a couple weeks ago our, our guest uh, lecture from Leeds, uh, Rabbi Cooperman, which was a great, uh, very successful lecture that we had here. And he shared the story, he shared a story about Rabbi Pincus, Rabbi Shimshim Pincus. Now, Rabbi Cooperman's goal in sharing the story was more to share something about me. It was a little bit of a, as a, the story he shared was that Rabbi Pincus got up 
and talked about uh, that in New York City, there's this ice cream shop that has 101 flavors and it's Chalav Yisrael. And Rabbi Pincus's message was that we should not be viewing physical pleasures as an enemy, but rather as a tool to connect to God. That was what Rabbi Kuberman mentioned. And then afterwards he mentioned that I went over to Rabbi Pincus and asked him for the address of the ice cream shop. Okay, fine. Now, Rabbi Pincus was a person a very spiritual person, a great Torah scholar, right? His works today have been translated. Many, many of his books are translated to English. I'm looking right now at his, a few of his works here. But he always focused on the following. When a person has the opportunity to enjoy things of the world, enjoy it, but do it and see God in it, right? Think about the wisdom that is necessary for this fruit to be produced or for the cheesecake to be produced. Think about how man was inspired by God. Appreciate the Almighty and make a bracha because you could connect to God through physical pleasures. Now, Rabbi Pincus' way of thinking was one that, you know, I was taught at a young age. I studied under him. These are completely different schools than a Rab Chatzka Levenstein. When one of them, Rabbi Levenstein, focuses on spiritual development by detaching from the world and not allowing enjoyment to affect your spiritual growth. For Rabbi Pincus, physical enjoyment is an integral part of our spiritual journey because I enjoy it and I can thank God. And a person needs to choose their school and you can't just blend them, right? You can't have an institution that one teacher, and this is a problem that exists in some schools, that you could have a school, a besiako, that one teacher is teaching from 9 to 10 a.m. with one philosophy and from 10 to 11 a different philosophy. And for the students, if they don't really recognize that these are completely different approaches, there's a level of confusion. There's an importance of having both, in my opinion, but you have to recognize what is what. And with that, I want to return to the camp of the Israelites. And I want to share with you the following, that the camp of the Levites represent people that are very, very much expecting perfection, right? The Levite is Mr. Measurement. And what I mean by that is that if you want to know the exact measurement for how much you have to eat, the dry halachic teaching, you're going to turn to the Levi, right? And it's interesting to note that when it comes to the gift that we give to the Leviim, the gift has to be a precise amount. You give them ma'aser, me'eser, a tenth. He's Mr. Precision, right? He's a detailed-oriented individual. Focuses on self-control. That's the Levi. The Kohen, on the other hand, is the person of the spirit. The person like Rabbi Pincus, who tells you, appreciate the world, see God in the world, love people, interact with people. It's not a person that you turn to if you want to know the precision in a halachic practice because he focuses more on the spirit of Judaism. But just as if you have in your backyard a pool that, which is water, right, which is not stable, right, which is fluid, you need to have good borders on your pool to keep it intact. The machane leviya serves as like that border for the spirit of the Kohen. In other words, when someone only has the spirit, and only focuses on love and on appreciation, he may forget what time you have to dive in your mincha because he's so focused on developing just the spirit, right? It's like the fire that has no boundaries. The levy focuses on boundaries. And therefore, although it is extremely important to understand that in Hashkafa, there are different schools, there are different schools, right? And sometimes you'll pick up a Dvar Torah, and the Dvar Torah simply doesn't talk to you. It doesn't talk to you. There's nothing wrong with it. Now, don't put it on the ground. Respect it. But you're allowed to say, this is not my school. It's not my way of thinking. My way of thinking is different. My way of thinking is appreciating the world, right? My way of thinking is seeing the divine spirit in every human being. I don't deal well with the Dvar Torah that puts down humanity, right? I don't deal well with the Dvar Torah that talks about the goyim as people that are simply all terrible. I'm not, it doesn't talk to me because I believe that I could see significance in Klal Yisrael 
without putting down the nations of the world, right? So you have to know where you are coming from. You have to understand where you are coming from and you have to find a teacher that talks to you. Some people need that Cohen teacher. The Cohen teacher, Oebe Sabrios, sees within nature the beauty of Hashem. Studies Torah, but at the same time understands that very well, just as a, when I study Torah, I see God, I study nature, I see HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's the man of spirit, Ohevet Tabriot. And then there are the Levites, the Levites, right? That they give you halachic precision. And if you change a minute a little bit, they'll go crazy because they function in some ways with this expectation that everything is done in a very precise and specific way. Cloud Listral needs them both, right? And what we are going to be told by this format is, remember what the core of Judaism is. There's a core that needs that protection. So this is a little bit of my thoughts about the importance of keeping hashkafa as clear as halacha. And it's, it's an issue I've faced in the past because I've even heard a lecture that without him noticing is going to be sharing Divrei Torah from different schools. No your school, know your Ashkaf, and there's nothing wrong with saying some things talk to me and others simply do not. Not every part of Torah are we obligated to believe that it talks to me. Obviously, there's the Talmud that talks to all Jews, and obviously there's the Torah Shabal Peh, but when it comes to a Vertlach, a Vort, right, for some people they hear a nice Gematria, it inspires them. For others, a good Gematria is not something that I want as my Dvar Torah at my Shabbos table, I want something that tells me a little bit about the human condition and about how Torah and the rabbinic tradition understands how Torah gives me the tools to go ahead and develop myself. So Parshat Naso is about the formation in the wilderness, but it's, how for, it's for us to form a life of meaning. That is how we learn the Parsha. I'm going to end off, I'm going to end off with a statement from the Jerusalem Talmud, which is in small print but it's a statement that is quoted by one of the two schools. Remember the two schools? We'll call them the Rabchatzka Levenstein school, where you're not going to eat dessert because you have too much of a desire. And Rab Shimshin Pinkis school, who would say, eat your dessert, eat the dessert, enjoy it, but remember that it was given to you by God Almighty. So Rab Shimshin Pinkis would often quote the following statement from the Yerushalmi, and the Jerusalem Talmud tells us that you should know that atid adam litendin vecheshbon, every person is going to be judged after 120, al kol shera'a eno velo achal. If there are things you desired, right, and you wanted to eat them, and you did not eat them, meaning I go into a supermarket, and I see a mango, and I have a desire for that mango, and I say, you know what, I'm going to overcome my temptation. So the Jerusalem Talmud tells us you're going to be judged, meaning that was not the right practice. And the Talmud all adds, that this is the last statement in the Jerusalem Talmud in Tractate Kiddushin, that Reb Lazar Chashash was concerned. And therefore, although he was extremely poor, he would collect putot, and once a year, he was careful once a year, chad bishata, once a year he was careful to taste all the delicacies and all the fruits because he wanted to taste them and appreciate God. Because you could connect to God by appreciating the world, the spirit of the Kohen, the spirit of seeing God in nature, seeing God in people, and that is what kavod is about. The kavod is, I see that everything is marbeh, Kvot Shamaim, and therefore, if I could use the magnificent fruit or cake or item or good cheese for some or good wine for others or obviously a good coffee, if I use it appropriately and I make the brach and I appreciate the Almighty, that is Marbe Kvot Shamaim, and that is the good Kavod, and that is the core of the camp and should be the core of our Jewish life. This is what we are told. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors again. And thank you, Shane Houses, and thank you, George and Florence. And I thank everyone for participating in this class where we were able to hopefully study a little bit of this very interesting Parsha. And we're going to unmute everyone for.